So with that, I'm pleased to introduce our speaker. So today we have Kendrick Lee, who is a postdoc in biostatistics. All right. Thank you for the introduction. Um, and thank you for inviting me to give this presentation. The title of the presentation today is Addressing Selection and Confounding Bias in Test Negative Study Design for Flu and COVID-19 Monitoring. Um, I guess I'll skip the self-introduction. Um, I'm, I'm just currently a postdoc at Department of Biostatistics and hope I kind of hope to see you around if I ever come to campus. Um, yeah, never mind. Um, so I think we can all agree that understanding how effective a vaccine is has become more and more um, relevant these days. Um, to understand vaccine efficacy, a random, sorry, a golden standard is randomized clinical trial design, which try to answer the question of how effective a vaccine is in the target population. Although often give an unbiased answer, um, randomized clinical trials often restrict in, in a population with fairly restrictive exclusion criteria, and randomized clinical trial the trials are often conducted in ideal conditions and pretty hard to generalize. On the other hand, if um, vaccine effectiveness often refer to the measure of how well a vaccine performs in the wider population, and may often be of more interest. For flu, COVID-19, and some other infectious diseases, test negative design has become a more and more um, adopted study design to study vaccine effectiveness. Um, in a test negative design, patients with, for example, for COVID-19, patients with COVID-like symptoms are selected in the study sample. Some of them may truly have the disease, but some of them may have may have some other diseases but manifest COVID-like COVID illness, which defines the test positive cases and test negative controls. The vaccine rates are then compared between the between the test positive cases and test negative controls to give a measure of vaccine effectiveness which here we write as VB. Very often it is simply one minus the risk ratio of risking vaccinated divided by risking unvaccinated. Recent examples of test negative designs include um, inferring the vaccine effectiveness of COVID-19 vaccines and comparing the effectiveness of three doses versus two doses vaccines. As a motivating example, throughout the talk, we'll use the data set from University of Michigan Health System data. We select the electronic health records of patients who interacted with the system last year when COVID-19 vaccine became widely available. Here is a table of baseline covariates of the patients. We see that there is an imbalance in terms of the baseline characteristics between the vaccinated and unvaccinated, such as um, age, gender, and comorbidity score. A standard estimation method in test negative design is logistic regression. Using a standard logistic regression, we see that the three um, vac the, the vaccine effectiveness for three predominant vaccines, Pfizer, Moderna, and Johnson & Johnson, ranges from 56% to 75%. If you're familiar with the COVID-19 literature, you can see that these numbers are relatively small. And for the rest of the talk, we will highlight that these numbers are likely to underestimate the vaccine effectiveness in the target population and show that how we can detect and correct such biases. To proceed, we first need to understand why and when a task negative design works. Here we use a directed acyclic graph or DAG to illustrate the relationship between variables. 
we let A be vaccination, Y be infection, and S be a binary indicator of being tested and selected into the study sample. Um, a major concern in post-market vaccine studies is confounding by healthcare seeking behavior. This is because vaccinated patients are more likely those who adopt a more healthful lifestyle. So they might be more willing to lower the infection risk by wearing a mask or avoid the crowd. And when they actually feel ill, they might be more likely to go to the clinics and seek care or get tested. Therefore, such latent healthcare be seeking behavior is likely to cause um, substantial bias if not appropriately accounted for. A major assumption of test negative design is that because all the study subjects are those who get tested, they have an identical level of healthcare seeking behavior. Therefore, every arrow coming out of healthcare seeking behavior in the DAG can be removed and the causal path for confounding and selection bias can be blocked. However, such justification is likely to be overly simplified. First, um, healthcare seeking behavior is more likely to be spectrum and unlikely to be binary. Therefore, it is not likely to be entirely captured by a binary indicator of getting tested and selected. Second, there may be other unmeasured confounding confounders like occupation as a healthcare worker, being residents of care facilities, etc. So a more likely, a more probable DAG may look like this as shown in the slide, where we have the unmeasured conf confounder U that may cause us R, A, Y, and S. It may cause confounding bias due to the path A to U to Y. And because the study, the analysis conditions on S equals one, it may also cause collider stratification bias through the path A to U to S to Y. Finally, um, because the analysis is restricted to the tested subjects, it might lack generalizability to the target population. The main issue of this type of DAG, where the latent factor also causes selection bias, is that many measures of causal effects cannot be identified. There are other challenges in test negative designs. They are equally important, but um, we'll focus on the selection and confounding bias in this presentation and um, leave these issues for future research. So now the question is, how can we detect the unmeasured confounding bias? The approach we'll use is an active control approach, which is increasingly popular in epidemiologic research. Um, this approach relies on two types of measured covariates. One is negative control exposure, we denote as Z. Um, this is a, a variable a priori known to not cause the outcome of interest. Here is the COVID-19 infection. Another variable is the negative control outcome or NCO, which we denote as W, with, sorry, here, which is a priori known not to be caused by the, not to be affected by the exposure of interest. Here, it, here um, it's the vaccination, COVID-19 vaccination. So in the study sample, um, if there is no unmeasured confounder and X is properly adjusted for, C should be um, conditionally independent of Y and A should be conditionally independent of W. In other words, in the study sample, if we detect and if we observe an association between Z, Y, and A, W, then this may indicate the presence of unmeasured confounder. In the University of Michigan health data, 
we select immunization visit before December 2020 as, the, as NCE because COVID-19 vaccines were not available at that time. And prior immunization is likely to associate with healthcare seeking behavior, which is our major confounder. Using a standard logistic regression model, we see that COVID-19 infection is significantly associated with the NCE, which indicates um, confounding, a measured confounding. We select NCO to be the presence of the following conditions, including armor lag subliters, IO air disorder, et cetera. These um, conditions are not likely to be caused by, by the COVID-19 vaccination. Um, again, using a standard logistic regression, we see that um, the, the NCO is significantly associated with the COVID-19 vaccination, which also indicates a measured confounding. So now that we have detected the, the confounding bias, the problem is we still don't know um, how much the bias, how much bias the, 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 the unmeasured confounders cause for our VE estimate. So for the rest of the talk, I'll introduce how can we adjust for the unmeasured confounding bias using the negative control variables. So let's review the challenges and available variables. We have this latent factor U and we condition on S equals one, um, which results in unmeasured confounding bias and collider stratification bias. And we have the NCE and NCO that can help us to address these biases. So for simplicity, we'll assume a common risk ratio model. Here is what the model looks like. Um, so it looks a little bit complicated, but the main idea is um, the risk ratio in every stratum defined by U and X are identical and it is the exponential of beta. So under this common conditional risk ratio model, you can, you can show that the marginal causal risk ratio is identical to the conditional risk ratio, which is exponential of beta. It is also very straightforward to incorporate effect modification by measured covariate sets. Um, if we so let's forget about selection bias and focus on confounding bias. If we can observe all the variables, including the latent factor U, then a common method to estimate the, the causal effect is inverse probability of treated weighting method, which estimates potential outcome simply by weighting the outcome in each treatment arm um, by the inverse probability of receiving the treatment in every strata. So then the causal risk ratio can just be identified as, as the ratio of these two. This would result in the inverse, inverse if, um, if we don't have this latent factor U, um, this formula would just result in the IPTW estimator in Schnitzer 2022 which is proposed to estimate the VE for COVID-19 vaccines. Of course, we cannot estimate this propensity score in the IPTW estimator because U is unobserved. The, the strategy that we use is to use a surrogate function, which is connected to the propensity score by a conditional um, expectation operator, condition on the latent factor U. So we can show that in the IPTW estimator, um, if we replace this inverse probability with the surrogate function, then we can recover the main potential outcome. We call this surrogate function a treatment confounding bridge function.
The problem, now the question is, how can we estimate the treatment confounding bridge function? Um, we propose to leverage the negative control outcome. This is because we can show the, the, um, the, the treatment confounding bridge function satisfies this integral equation. The good thing about this integral equation is that if we have data from the target population, then this integral equation doesn't contain any unmeasured factors. All the variables here are observed. Now, of course, up to now, we have um, overlooked selection bias. Um, for example, in the integral equation that we use to estimate the treatment confounding bridge function and the mean potential outcome, the, the expectation is taken with respect to the target population. However, in a TND, we only have data from the tested sample, which conditions on S equals one. So unfortunately in a TND, because of selection bias, we cannot identify the mean potential outcome. But you can show that um, under the assumption that the treatment does not directly cause, cause the selection, the, the, cause, the causal risk ratio can still be identified using pretty much the same IPTW formula as before. In a TND also, because of selection bias, we cannot estimate the treatment bridge function using the previous integral equation. But if the disease is relatively rare in the target population, you can show that the integral equation approximately holds in the control group of the target population. So, so therefore, we can solve this integral equation to estimate the treatment confounding bridge function. In practice, um, estimating the propensity score on the right-hand side can be complicated, but you can show that if this integral equation holds, then the, the integral equation, then the estimating equation here on the bottom um, is unbiased. Here, M is the, a user specified arbitrary function. Overall, this results in a relatively simple algorithm for a deep biased um, causal risk ratio estimate. The first step is to identify suitable NCEs and NCOs depending um, based on domain knowledge. The second step is to estimate the treatment confounding bridge function using the estimating equation here. Then we can estimate the log causal risk ratio using a plug-in estimator. Finally, VE, the estimated VE is just one minus the exponential of beta. Are there any questions for now? I don't okay. see any online and then not seeing any in the room. Okay, awesome, thank you. Um, so the above algorithm can also be summarized into solving, solving an estimating equation. The good thing about this representation is that we can then get a standard error of our VE estimate using standard estimating equation theory. So here we conduct a simulation study to evaluate the, the performance of our method. We consider two scenarios. In the first scenario, all variables are binary, including the negative control variables and the latent factor. In the second scenario, all the variables are continuous. We consider four um, methods. The first is the negative control method that we propose. The second is the negative control oracle method. NC Oracle math method, <coughs> where instead of using an estimated treatment confounding bridge function, we use the true value of the treatment confounding bridge function, such that we can vision how, how much 
the variation of the estimation of treatment confounding bridge function is. And as comparison, we also include logistic regression estimator and IPTW estimator. These two don't appropriately account for the latent factor. So here we look at the biases and coverage rates of 95% confidence intervals of the four methods. Both NC and NC Oracle methods are essentially unbiased, while logistic regression and IPTW estimator have severe bias. Also, the confidence intervals for NC and NC oracles are well calibrated, while the, the ones for logistic regression and IPTW suffer from severe undercoverage. The same is for the continuous cases. Um, we have mentioned that our method mainly works when the disease is relatively rare. So what happened, so here we show the simulation study under the scenarios where the disease is more frequent in the target population. Um, we consider the case where the vaccine actually has no effect or the vaccine has, um, the vaccine reduces the infection risk. We see that, um, when the vaccine has no effect, the NC estimator still remains unbiased even if the disease is frequent. But if the disease has a, has a positive effect, then the NC estimator is biased when the disease becomes more frequent. Also here we consider the coverage rates of the 95% confidence intervals. If the, if the vaccine has no effect, then the confidence intervals for the NC estimators remain calibrated. But if it is if the vaccine has a positive effect, then the confidence interval for the NC estimator has under coverage when the disease becomes more frequent. So the main message here is that although, although the NC estimator can be biased when disease becomes more frequent, it still provides a valid hypothesis testing method for no vaccine effect. So let's go back to our um, University of Michigan data example. Using the NC method, the, the estimated VE ranges from 66% to 87% closer to the contemporary observational studies. Overall, we have introduced a formal free framework to argue about the confounding and selection bias in a TND study. Um, we, also, um, we also introduced a, a method to do bias the VE estimate from TND studies. As shown in our manuscript, our methods can, although our method is motivated by a TND study, it can also be used for other outcome-dependent outcome um, observational studies. There are several other extensions which I'll not go into details. These are the collaborators on this project. Um, yeah, so this concludes my presentation. Are there any other questions? Hi, uh, yeah, thank you for the nice talk. It's a um, really important area and it seems like your uh, method could be really useful. Um, thank you. I'm curious about the part of, um, Trying to come up with what these and um, uh, these control uh, uh, variables that you uh, identified in the in that uh, medical records, um, it says it's sort of domain knowledge. But I'm curious if your uh, simulation studies give you intuition about um, um, how to identify uh, good controls um, in terms of like coverage or like um, good um, correlation with the outcomes or like 
what what should we be looking for in order to identify these in practice? Yeah, thank you. That is a pretty important question that I've asked a lot. Um, so I think a good analogy will be instrumental variable method. Um, so for example, in, in a Mendelian randomization study, the instrumental variable methods, the instrumental variables, um, they're, they're also mainly selected by domain knowledge, although there are data-driven data methods. Those data-driven methods cannot be, um, they, they cannot always be adequately justified. This is the same for active control variables. The best approach so far is still based on domain knowledge. Of course, in a study, sometimes you have multiple candidate and active control variables. Then in such scenario, you might, you might use some hand wavy methods, such as looking at their association with the, the, the treatment and the outcome to select probably the best negative control variables for that particular analysis. Does that answer the question? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I guess one option is just to not be able to do the study, right? So rather than pick up from among a set of bad ones to say, I don't have a good control set to work with here. Uh, so, you know, you could yeah. like, not do it, right? Yeah. So. Yeah, so here our method is to address a measured confounding bias. Of course, if you don't have appropriate um, ancillary variables for our approach, you can, you can always use sensitivity analysis. And there are other methods to address how measured confounding that can be used. We just provide an alternative and potentially a method for sensitivity analysis. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, just a quick study. Yeah. So, so one comment is uh, uh, have you captured uh, some more like, bigger data like N3C data? N3C has uh, over many millions of records. Yeah, it's the largest uh, COVID 19 study. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's much bigger. Than, I, I actually have a comment. Yeah, I have a project. Yeah. Yeah, I'm quite interested in seeing if you know, like uh, we can use your data for your method for like bigger. It's probably I don't know. I haven't used uh, the uh, our Michigan data, but uh, I assume it's much bigger than Michigan data. Yeah. Michigan data actually has been uploaded to NCC. Oh yeah, so, thank you. Um, yeah, we haven't we haven't used the very big data sets. But I have some follow-up methods, which is essentially the same, but provide more robust and efficient estimators. Um, I, I, will be, I will be very happy for any collaboration, especially in terms of data access, because you know this is a statistical method. Gaining data access to illustrate a method is always very difficult. So, so we can talk further, and I can give you my email after the talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, it seems like the computation is relatively straightforward, but I'm curious if you have um, like a, a case study or 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 um, framework in which you implemented this, and and I, if somebody wanted to reproduce the work or apply it to a new situation, is there a um, a tool or a framework or sort of a uh, case study analysis that, that, um, that would be a good starting place for somebody else to do it? Uh, sorry, can you, can you probably give me- uh, For instance, did you implement this in R and is there like a notebook that, that goes through and uses um, packages within R specifically to do this or is it a- Yeah, R you know, or, you know, what, what tool did you use to make this work? Yeah, I used R to implement the method, but I think it it's probably not that well documented. Um, the method is on my GitHub, so you can you can look up the code. Um, yeah, but I I probably didn't did didn't do a good job to go through one analysis. That's a good point, though. I I will probably add a markdown document 
to, to illustrate the analysis. Fantastic. Thank you. A reminder, if you're online and you have questions, you can feel free to put them in the chat box or uh, use the Zoom reactions at the bottom right of your screen to raise your hand. If others in the room have questions, feel free to ask them. Yeah, I have another question. So uh, in terms of the, the variable, like uh, how many variables you, you can like uh, you can consider simultaneously? Yeah. Sorry, can you say again? What, what was the question? Because uh, we may have a lot of variables, right? To right. consider, right? So yeah. like, uh, let's say if you have 10 or 20 different uh, uh, variables, you don't know, you want to you want to count, you want to consider the effects of these different variables. I'm kind of thinking like, uh, what, what's the procedure? How, how you do it yet? Yeah, thank you. That's a very good question. Um, for now, for now, there are there are no common conclusions on what happened in such scenarios. This is this is very much the same as instrument in the instrumental variable area. When there are many instrumental variables, there are methods to use, for example, um, lasso type pen penalty to select instrumental variables. But, but you know, those areas are under active research. The same as for network control variables. Um, if you look up, there are, there are like, there are, there are a paper called many, many proxies or, or many negative control variables. But I don't know, there are not good methods for that for now. So, so, so the scenario that you mentioned is definitely a, a challenging scenario. What I would suggest is for now, you can just use some hand wavy method, like select something that you think might be the most relevant to the, to the unmeasured confounders or use like logistic regression or some other regression models to look, look into how, how associated they are with the, with the treatment and the outcome. Thank you. Still no questions online. Does anyone else in the room have more questions? Give it another minute in case anyone's typing anything online. So there's a question uh, that just came in online from Dana. So she said, thank you for a great talk. Sorry if I missed this, but can you speak a bit more about why causal inference is useful here and the advantages and disadvantages to other approaches like regression? Oh, thank you. This is a good question. So causal inference, um, I think the reason that causal inference might be more useful here is that there is a formal free framework in causal inference to argue about causal vac vaccine effectiveness that, that account for the unmeasured confounders. In regression models, you can, you can always include this unmeasured confounder in a regression model. Um, in fact, our, our framework our framework is based on this type of semi-parametric model where um, we can argue that this beta has a causal interpretation. But you can see this, you can see our work has based on both or either causal inference or the, this type of regression model. As I said, causal inference, um, the, the idea of causal inference is more agnostic towards the model, um, but, but a model may give you more straightforward ideas of how, how the unmeasured confounder goes into, goes into your vaccine effect. So both have their advantages. Does that answer the question? I think my answer was a little vague.
Dana said that yes, that mostly answered her question. Yeah, thank you. We'll continue to wait another moment in case anyone else is typing anything online. And again, if anyone else in the room has come up with more questions, feel free to ask at this time. Yeah, you can ask another one. Yeah, so uh, you have the N of C, right? One is outcome, one is the uh, the variable, right? right? So how do you treat them differently? Uh, let me let me find find that for you. <clears throat> so here we have active control exposure and active control outcome, right? Are you are you asking about the difference or? Yeah, the difference for for, for uh, the treatment. Yeah, your, your model. Yeah. Right. So, simply speaking, the NCE does not cause the outcome, and the NCO is not caused by the treatment. That's their difference. Okay. Yeah, so basically, the linkage, right? Yeah. Yeah. So here I have dashed arrows. Um, they indicate the causal effects that can that may that may either or uh, that may either exist or not exist. It doesn't matter. If we if we remove all these dashed arrows, then you can see that there are variables. Um, that may either be considered as NCE or NCO. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Are there any other questions? All right. I think we can give our speaker one more round of applause. Thank you so much. All right. And thank you, everyone, for attending today. Goodbye.